Sekiro Shadows Die Twice is the great outlier, the black sheep of Soulsborne games. On the periphery it treads familiar ground, but at its core, it offers a notably different gameplay experience, boasting a combat system that demands respect in a way that, even to this day, no other Soulsborne title does to the same degree. This isn't a different take on the formula, this is rewriting the rules of engagement, and the way it all comes together is… brilliant. To even include it under the Soulsborne umbrella is a point of contention for some. Personally, I do not care, but for the sake of this video, I will be doing just that. The term black sheep often evokes negative connotations, but in the case of Sekiro, it is quite the opposite. I mean, it depends who you ask, right? Sekiro is my all-time favourite FromSoft game, but its distinct lack of RPG mechanics and how it forces you to learn its combat system with no way of deviating from it may be disappointing for those who have come to expect otherwise from these titles. Soulsborne games have never been for everyone, but Sekiro in particular asks a lot from the player. Its learning curve is steep and its punishment is brutal, but if you persevere, the sense of accomplishment it delivers is extraordinary. There are very few games that can match it. We're closely approaching its five-year anniversary, so let's look back and see what makes it so special. Sekiro breaks the mold of standard Soulsborne games immediately. The intro cinematic actually offers quite a bit of information that leaves no room for doubt. This is the end of the Sengoku period in Japan, where the country is consumed by a state of perpetual conflict. The fighting reaches its end when a now legendary warrior named Ishin Ashina leads a coup and defeats the general Tamura, seizing control of the land in doing so. In the aftermath, we see a wandering shinobi known as Owl come across a nameless orphan on the battlefield. Owl dubs the boy Wolf and takes him in as a foster son, training him in the ways of the shinobi and indoctrinating him with the Iron Code, which bids that his father's word is absolute and his master's word is a close second. The game takes place around two decades after Ishin's coup. Wolf is entrusted with the duty of protecting a young lord named Kuro, the Divine Heir, whose bloodline is one of mysterious power known as the Dragon's Heritage, granting him, and potentially others, immortality. Kuro's blood is the main driver behind this game's plot, particularly as the Ashina clan is now on the brink of collapse. Sekiro has a much more clearly defined narrative compared to Dark Souls and all that, but I'll only be touching on it here and there. This video will mainly focus on gameplay elements. Speaking of breaking the mold, Sekiro places emphasis on movement options in its opening level. You can jump, wall jump, shimmy across tight ledges, and sprint to your heart's content. There's no stamina meter in this game, at least not in a conventional sense, and it's something that should be taken advantage of as much as possible. Combine all this with a grappling hook, and you have the makings of a highly mobile character. The game makes use of this in its level design. There's a lot of verticality here, leading to gorgeous vistas and a tremendous sense of scale. The art direction takes inspiration from medieval Japan, but in classic FromSoft fashion, there's an otherworldly element that becomes more and more prominent as you go deeper into the game. The visual presentation is engaging, with differing environments, a vast colour palette, and changes in the weather, bringing a distinct feel to each location. The verticality of areas leads to a linear structure. It's an interconnected world with branching paths and optional areas, but usually they'll just take you to a dead end hiding some… not entirely useless loot, but pretty close to it. There's a wonderful sense of accessibility with the grappling hook, but rewards for exploration are limited. Outside of the occasional prosthetic tool upgrade or rare prayer bead, there's really nothing to get excited over in terms of items, and it doesn't take long before you're overflowing with ceramic shards and fistfuls of ash. Beneficial consumables exist aplenty, but a lot of them feel superfluous and lack any meaningful impact, besides one or two select instances. That could just be me, maybe I haven't experimented with them enough. But movement options are not the only thing emphasised in the opening level, stealth mechanics are as well. Honestly, stealth in this game is shallow at best. You can hide from enemies in tall grass or by means of the grappling hook, and then sneak up behind them for an easy one-shot kill. That's about it, really. 
I do love the Blood Smoke ninjutsu though, which allows you to regain stealth after a death blow. It's great in the right situation. Stealth is integrated into the game just fine. It's not complex, and the enemy AI is about as basic as it gets, but in a way I feel this benefits more than hinders. Stealth is a consistent means of thinning the herd, which is good, because this game gets awfully messy when you are outnumbered. By extension of this, it also removes some of the headache involved with respawning enemies, and the same applies to the grappling hook. You don't always need to fight fodder enemies head on here. If things are getting too hectic in the heat of battle, more often than not you can simply run away or reach higher ground, allowing you to reset things and regain your composure. The benefits you can reap from proper use of stealth and these movement capabilities are substantial, to the point where if you know what you're doing you can bypass huge chunks of the game without fighting a single enemy. That kind of thing does require a certain know-how though, something you're just not going to have on your first playthrough. I would describe Sekiro as deceptively intricate. Things are straightforward on the surface, but there is a lot of nuance to be found here. Luckily, with experience comes knowledge, and it can be used to great effect. However, to gain this knowledge you must fight your way through the game, and this is where things get tricky. Sekiro has all the usual trappings you'd expect from a Soulsborne title. We got sculptors' idols acting as save, rest, and travel points, respawning fodder enemies, interconnectivity in its world design, an Estus Flask-esque healing system, as well as medicinal pellets that emulate life gems, and finally a punishing adventure that tests your capabilities like few others. And in this case, that includes every title under the Soulsborne umbrella. Sekiro's difficulty is no secret. Its gameplay experience is notoriously challenging with an extremely steep learning curve. So much so that when the game first came out, some players and even journalists were calling for an easy mode to be implemented. Pathetic. I disagree vehemently with the notion of an easy mode, but I do understand why there were calls for it. As I said in the intro, this game asks a lot from the player, far more than anyone expected, I imagine, and it all comes down to the way combat is handled, so let's talk about it. Sekiro's combat system is one of a singular nature. At the start of the game, you're given your katana. This is your primary weapon for the entire adventure, and it's another way Sekiro differentiates itself from its Soulsborne brethren. You eventually gain access to a bunch of secondary tools and even a secondary blade at one point, but they are just that, secondary. Kosobimaru is your go-to for every encounter, and the game goes on to explain the basic mechanics of combat with some convenient pop-up boxes. As a side note, I never understood why Bloodborne's tutorial messages were sort of hidden away in the Hunter's Dream. In fact, I clearly remember my brother having to explain to me how trick weapons worked on my first playthrough, because I completely missed them. I guess I only have myself to blame for not exploring the Hunter's Dream well enough, but the way Sekiro delivers this information is just better, I feel. The game tells us that all opponents have posture, and the key to defeating them is breaking their posture. With this in mind, all enemies have both a health bar and a posture bar. Depleting the enemy's health bar will kill them, but most of the time it is far more optimal to target their posture bar instead. The design of encounters revolves around this concept and encourages it. As you land attacks and deflect enemy attacks, their posture bar will increase, and when it maxes out, they become staggered, allowing you to deal a death blow. And that is the basic essence of combat. Obviously there's a bit more to it, but at a fundamental level, that is it, and there is something to admire about its simplicity. It's what allows the game to be so focused, as almost everything revolves around this one concept. Wolf, the player character, also has a health and posture bar that acts similarly to the enemies. If your health bar depletes, you're dead, but if your posture bar reaches capacity, you become staggered, giving the enemy an easy swipe at you. The best way to avoid this is to deflect enemy attacks, but the term deflection refers to instances where you press the block button just before the enemy's attack lands. Some people like to call it a perfect parry. Holding the block button will put up your guard, which you can use to prevent attacks from landing on you, but this method does not deal any posture damage to the enemy, and it also means you will eventually become staggered. 
Deflections, on the other hand, not only affect the enemy's posture, but they also prevent your posture from ever reaching max capacity. Sekiro is all about the interplay between attacking and deflecting. The name of the game is breaking the enemy's posture while keeping yours intact. And the way posture is implemented here is the game's strongest aspect, because it turns your defensive toolkit into a means of offense. All in all, combat is simple to understand, attack when you can and deflect when you must. However, simple does not always translate to easy, and Sekiro epitomizes this notion to a T. You don't have any special weaponry or overpowered armor sets to make your life easier here. You can't grind for stat increases either, the only way to do that is by collecting prayer beads, but most of them serve as rewards for defeating bosses and mini-bosses. There are some potent shinobi tools and flashy combat arts which we'll talk about in a bit, but otherwise it's just you, your sword, and the enemy. What this all means is you have no choice but to play the game on its terms, and this is where the difficulty arises. Combat here involves timing, reflexes, rhythmic execution, understanding attack patterns and responding to them accordingly. It relies solely on the player's ability. Therefore, succeeding in the face of Sekiro's challenge comes down to individual skill. This game is effectively one giant skill check, and it is ruthless, never letting up or giving any quarter whatsoever. Even for FromSoft standards, the level of punishment here borders on cruelty. One mistake, the slightest misstep or misinput can be incredibly costly. This is only accentuated through enemies' use of perilous attacks, signified by the red kanji symbol appearing above Wolf's head. There are four types, grabs, sweeps, thrusts, and lightning attacks. Unsurprisingly, you want to avoid these, and whilst grabs require you to dodge, thrust attacks can be turned against your opponent via the always awesome Makiri counter. The same applies to sweeps, where you can jump and land on the enemy, dealing posture damage in the process, as well as the much rarer lightning attacks through a technique called lightning reversal. Thrust attacks are by far the most common of these four, so the Makiri counter is essential. It is super satisfying to perform, not just because it looks great in action, but also because it conveys a very tangible feeling of shutting down an opponent's attack. Crucially though, it keeps up the pressure. It's another defensive tool in your arsenal which doubles as an offensive option. The seamless blending of offense and defense is where the real beauty of Sekiro's combat system lies. It is the crux of everything that makes combat here so great. Given how things are set up, you need to stay on your toes throughout the entire duration of the fight, but the perilous attacks heighten this feeling even further. Each one requires a different response. No matter what you use, whether it's the Makiri counter, or dodging or jumping or lightning reversal, you still need to consider timing and directional inputs to be successful. You need to concentrate for this shit, and even in New Game Plus, there were many times where I found myself going for a Makiri counter instead of jumping or dodging, which almost always resulted in death. It is demanding on the player. This is a game where you need to sit down and intently study the movesets of enemies through repeated trial and error. In a way, it feels like they need to be drilled into you, so that responding to them eventually becomes a matter of instinct. Couple this with the extreme levels of punishment, and it's easy to see how it can be too much for some people. There is an intimacy to each encounter because of all these factors. Every fight feels like a duel, your performance is based on your own skill level, so a personal touch extends from the player into the game itself. And for those who persevere, the reward for doing so is quite special. The single biggest payoff for playing this game is the feeling you get after defeating bosses. When you overcome its challenge, Sekiro delivers a state of euphoria that is unrivaled. Many games are tough, many games have great boss fights, and many games leave you with a sense of satisfaction upon defeating them, but I can't think of any that deliver on this sensation so potently and consistently quite like Sekiro. And it's not just after you conquer them either, you can literally feel the progression as you get better and better with each attempt, chaining deflections one after another in a manner that is so remarkably palpable. It is exhilarating. The final reward is found in subsequent playthroughs. 
If you make it to the end of the adventure, you're given the option to start New Game Plus, and because you are so adept at attacking and deflecting by that point, you'll just breeze through the game. It's amazing how comprehensively you are able to defeat enemies on repeat playthroughs. Bosses that once gave you a hard time are just smacked down almost effortlessly, and it feels great. I absolutely love the crazy amount of versatility possible in titles like Dark Souls and particularly Elden Ring. In the latter's case, it is mind-boggling how many different weapons, builds, spells, armor sets, and so on and so forth are on offer for the player to potentially utilize. Sekiro is the very antithesis of this, but by focusing everything on player ability, it ends up being just as engaging, if not even more engaging. It's impressive stuff. That's not to say those games don't rely on player ability, of course they do. There are just more ways to circumvent any lack of ability compared to this game. Now there's a bit more to combat we have yet to cover. Emphasis is placed on the posture bar, but that doesn't mean the health bar is doomed to irrelevancy. Quite the opposite, both bars are linked, and this is something the game doesn't go out of its way to explain. The more health an enemy has, the faster their posture bar recovers, and the inverse is also true. Lowering their health means the speed at which they recover their posture is reduced dramatically. As a result, the game generously rewards aggressive playstyles. In fact, it's often the best strategy. It places constant pressure on the enemy's posture, but it also gives the player a degree of control over the pacing of each engagement. When you're the one initiating exchanges, you're effectively setting the tempo of the fight, and the flow you can achieve off the back of this is tremendously satisfying. It's one of the best parts of the game. Being aggressive also lets you interrupt certain attacks. Sometimes it feels like you're locking enemies into place and forcing them to repeat the same move again and again, allowing you to react with ease every time. There is a part of me that thinks this was unintentional. It only lasts for a limited period, but it is easy posture damage, and in some cases even perilous attacks can be stopped dead in their tracks. I don't consider this cheesing the encounter, but it is something I notice for several bosses. At the same time though, it is a little inconsistent. Sometimes enemies will be interrupted, other times they won't, so there is risk involved as well. Regardless, there are clear benefits to playing aggressively. Most notably, it leads to incredibly exciting, super fast-paced, adrenaline fueled encounters that are just an absolute joy. Attacking and deflecting will always be your bread and butter, but additional combat options come in the form of skills and shinobi prosthetic tools. The latter are secondary weapons that provide offensive or defensive utility. Some even offer both. Getting the most out of the tools requires a lot of experimentation, and to the game's credit, the results are far-reaching, greatly varied, and sometimes quite surprising. For example, when the Headless Ape slumps to the ground, you can use the spear to rip out the centipede and deal massive posture damage. I had no idea this was possible, it would never have crossed my mind had my brother not informed me of it. It's extremely potent and can rack up posture damage very quickly. This is a prime example of how using the right tool in the right situation can provide so much value, and there are countless other examples as well, but again, you need the knowledge of that in the first place. All the tools can be upgraded multiple times as well, leading to more powerful versions, and I appreciate that the game lets you freely choose whichever version you want. I've seen some videos of the later versions, and a few of them are ridiculous, to the point where they almost completely trivialize certain fights, more so the mini-bosses than the major bosses, but I don't think that's too much of a problem here because you have to make it through the game to reach those versions. Getting all the resources necessary to upgrade every prosthetic tool is a lengthy task that takes multiple playthroughs, so your very first playthrough, the most crucial one, is definitely the least susceptible to cheese. The game becomes very easy once you make it to New Game Plus anyway, so I don't think some of these tools being overpowered is a big issue. Still, I wish I got more out of them in general. I have my personal favorites, namely the Shuriken, the Umbrella, and the Firecracker, but when it comes to stuff like Divine Abduction, Sobimaru, and the Mist Raven, I never use these. Since this is YouTube, I'm assuming some people will be angry at that statement, but the prosthetic tools are about as optional as can be. None of them are mandatory for progression, they're simply a means of complementing your katana. 
Make no mistake, there's a lot to be gained from using these tools, I just prefer deflecting everything personally. And that also applies to most of the abilities you can unlock. There are some obvious exceptions, Makiri Counter, Whirlwind Slash, which is great in the early game, all the passive upgrades, and stuff like mid-air deflections, grappling hook attack, etc. I get good use out of all of these, but big performable abilities like Ashen Across or Floating Passage, I don't use much. I do love using Mortal Draw though. This technique is just awesome, it looks stunning in action and deals massive damage. I adore the inkwash aesthetics on this ability, although it too may be a bit too powerful for its own good. I also think Sakura Dance is really fun to perform. Like the prosthetic tools, these skills are completely optional. What you choose to employ is up to you, but the essence of combat always remains the same. Something I have yet to mention is the resurrection mechanic. It works exactly as you would expect. Upon death, the player can choose to resurrect on the spot, rather than restarting from the last checkpoint. This feature is far more useful in New Game Plus than it is on your first playthrough. If you are not very proficient in combat and are unaware of the enemy's attack patterns, then the resurrection option more often than not just offers another opportunity to die. On New Game Plus, however, it acts as a buffer, giving you a means of recovering from a mistake. Before then, it may as well just be another healing item in your inventory. You don't have the skill to get the most out of it. Cheating death will always be handy in some situations, but overall, it doesn't make much of a difference. Outside of stuff relating to specific encounters and some other details I'll get to later, the only major issue I have with combat is the camera. It's the classic FromSoft camera complaint. When you or an enemy are backed up against a wall, the camera starts fighting with the lock-on function, and it can be a serious hindrance in the worst cases, doubly so when you must fight in a tight arena. I find myself having more camera issues in Sekiro than any other FromSoft game, because combat is very fast-paced, with enemies that love to dart around swiftly. Take Lady Butterfly, who is constantly jumping around the arena. It's easy to get blindsided and lose track of her. I also noticed it quite a lot with Gyobu. I feel like the elevated position he holds atop his horse makes the camera a bit funky at times. Bigger enemies, particularly those with erratic movement, seem to make things worse in this regard. The Guardian Ape, the Blazing Bull, the Demon of Hatred, etc, etc. I don't consider it a deal breaker by any stretch, but it is something that's cropped up every time I have played this game, and I don't like it. I also have to say, there is no doubt in my mind that combat here shines brightest in one-on-one -on -one encounters. When you're being swarmed by fodder enemies, things can get very ugly very quickly. However, if you consider the movement options, stealth, prosthetic tools, combat arts, and potentially items as well, you have more than enough to deal with every situation. It just comes down to utilizing these options to your advantage, and if you manage to do so, it can be very rewarding. For example, against Juzo the Drunkard in the Harata Estate, I formulated a strategy to deal with the six or so enemies he's surrounded by. This involved stealth killing this guy right here, and then immediately running to the bow-wielding enemy and taking him out. Then I chose to run around and wait for an opportunity to Makiri counter each enemy so I could land an easy death blow on them. Once they were all dead, I took on the chunky fella in a one-on-one -on -one battle, and it felt so good defeating him in the end. This one section took me almost two hours to complete. I even have a video file dedicated to just these attempts. You may think this an indication of how poor my strategy was, but I haven't played this game in many years, so I think it just came down to rustiness. It's also worth pointing out that I intentionally made things harder for myself this time around, and I guess that's something we should talk about. Sekiro has two completely optional hard modes, which can be enabled through in-game means. And here's the best part, they stack. This is how I played the game for this video, because I wanted to recapture that struggle every player experiences on their first run-through, as much as I possibly could anyway. There's a secret area in the game which houses the Demon Bell. Ringing it increases the combat stats of all enemies, so they deal more damage and receive less damage. If you manage to get through the game at least once, on your next playthrough you're given the option to hand Kuro his charm at the beginning of the adventure. 
This brings a bunch of negative effects, like increased enemy health and posture, the player receives 25% more damage, and a faster buildup of status effects such as poison. The most interesting thing about Kuro's charm, however, is that it makes the player receive chip damage when blocking attacks. The only way to avoid this is to land deflections. On paper this sounds like a fairly minor change, but it ends up being highly significant because when combined with the Demon Bell, your posture bar is almost always just below max capacity, so one mistake will stagger you and lead to death. Even if you don't get staggered though, mess up the timing and you'll die anyway from the chip damage. It's by far the most difficult thing to adjust to, as it requires pinpoint precision at all times. It's no exaggeration to say that this alone can be the difference between life and death, and in a way it feels like this is how the game was always meant to be played. Finally, in an attempt to make things even more interesting, I played the game with a controller. Sekiro is the only FromSoft title where I am more comfortable with a keyboard and mouse. It's just what I defaulted to back when it first came out, and I figured, why not, let's try it out with a controller. I knew I was setting myself up for a challenge, and that's exactly what I wanted, but I think I overdid it, because my first playthrough for this video was brutal. Of course, it was nothing compared to my actual first playthrough. At the end of the day, I know how to play this game. Still, that did not stop the onslaught of enemies from utterly destroying me again, and again, and again. It really was brutal, but my god, it was so worth it in the end, because for the first time in years, I was reminded of that feeling. The rush you get when you nail the flow of attacking and deflecting, the state of euphoria after conquering bosses. It is incredible. For those who have beaten this game and haven't played it in a while, I think it's absolutely worth it to go back and try again with these hard modes enabled. It's the closest thing you'll get to a repeat of your first playthrough. Just be prepared to suffer. Before we move on, I do want to quickly mention Unseen Aid, which as a system feels pretty pointless. It provides a chance of preventing the player from losing any money or experience points upon awakening from a true death as in when you respawn at an idol. Thing is, on your first playthrough, you're going to be dying a hell of a lot anyway, so Unseen Aid will likely only trigger when you have negligible amounts of money and experience. But when you get to New Game Plus, dying becomes a far less frequent occurrence, and given that Unseen Aid only has a chance to trigger, it sort of defeats its own purpose. It's rare for Unseen Aid to have any meaningful effect. And since we're on this topic, I may as well include the effects of Dragon Rot as something else that feels pointless. This is a disease that affects certain NPCs based on how often the player has died. There's a few cases where it can prevent progression of quests, but it's very easy to remedy with a certain item. Just like Unseen Aid, it's rare for Dragon Rot to have any meaningful impact, so it feels almost entirely arbitrary. With all that out of the way, the rest of the video will focus on the adventure itself, talking about levels, bosses, mini-bosses, and the overall gameplay experience. At the end of the opening sequence, we encounter Genichiro Ashina, the adoptive grandson of Ishin and current leader of the clan. He too is a formidable swordsman, and at this stage of the game he is basically unbeatable. On your first playthrough, anyway. This is meant to be a fight the player loses, a humbling indication of the difference in skill level for both Wolf and indeed the player. Genichiro easily overpowers the shinobi, slicing off his left arm in doing so, and leaving him for dead, whilst taking Kuro away to make use of his blood. Wolf awakens some time later in a dilapidated temple after being saved by a mysterious fellow known as the Sculptor. This is the game's effective starting point, with the dilapidated temple acting as something akin to a home base. After testing out the grappling hook, we find ourselves in the Ashina outskirts, where the first hurdles come in the form of two mini-bosses, General Naomori and the Chained Ogre. What we have here is a weapon-wielding enemy and a flailing beast enemy. Broadly speaking, these two types of enemies make up almost every encounter in the game, with some obvious variations here and there. General Naomori is a simple mini-boss, but he can be quite challenging first time round since the player will still be adjusting to combat. He serves as the introduction to some important concepts, perilous attacks being one of them. He has two types, a grab and a low sweep, forcing the player to recognize and respond to each one respectively. 
I praised the pop-up boxes before, but here the game throws them out in the middle of combat and it's intrusive. Another concept introduced here is multi-phase fights. He has a relatively small move set, but in his second phase he becomes much faster and more aggressive, with less windows between his attacks to make up for it. The only thing I dislike about him is the way he stops to recover his posture. He does this too often and it undermines the fight when he's close to defeat. Otherwise, this is a decent introductory mini-boss. He's no pushover, but he's not excessively difficult either. I described the Chained Ogre as a flailing beast just now. To be clear, I think the Ogre falls into that category, just not to the same degree as the Guardian Ape or the Demon of Hatred. A common criticism aimed at Sekiro is how the game introduces enemies which primarily require you to dodge as opposed to deflect, and the flailing beast encounters are accused of this the most. I do sort of understand what people mean by that, and I certainly think weapon-wielding enemies are more enjoyable to fight, but flailing beast attacks are deflectable, they're just not as easy to read. Outside of the perilous attacks, you can deflect every move the Chained Ogre throws at you, and that applies to attacks from other flailing beasts as well, so I'm not entirely convinced this criticism holds much weight. With that said, I will agree it's not obvious. Deflecting weapons is clear-cut, but deflecting an assortment of melee attacks from a 10-foot humanoid monstrosity is not quite the same. Dodging is a viable strategy against the Chained Ogre, which is probably what has led to that perception in the first place, but deflecting is always the better option due to the posture damage it inflicts. Either way, the Chained Ogre attacks with its fists and its feet, using a combination of kicks, elbow slams, and ground pounds to deal damage. Dealing with the ogre's grabs is what gives this fight its difficulty though, and these must be dodged, there's no other way to avoid them. In this respect, it's important to remain disciplined and not get too greedy when attacking, so you can dodge away in time, because the window to do so is very tight. It's also here where another feature of combat becomes apparent, tracking. Enemies' attacks track you with godlike precision in this game, and sometimes it is so blatant it verges on comical. Many grab attacks have such a large range, it feels like the enemy is defying physics, and it's not just relegated to the Chained Ogre, either. This is something that takes some time to get used to. You have the tools to deal with the tracking, it's just a matter of learning how to use them. From the Chained Ogre, we grapple up to this balcony and onto the next area, where we must take on General Tenzen and his horde of goons. I was actually stuck on this part for a while, because as soon as the enemies start grouping up, it becomes a problem. There's a lot of value to be gained from using stealth in sections like this, and I did find some fulfillment in trying to figure out how best to proceed, but overall, it was a bit of a mess. Most things are at this stage of the game. General Tenzen is basically General Naomori on steroids. His moveset is bigger, his attacks are faster, and he can unleash devastating combos that rip you to shreds. It's a very noticeable step up in difficulty, so taking out the enemies beforehand is essential. This guy needs to be fought in isolation. Afterwards, there's a memorable set-piece moment where we stab a giant serpent in the eye before reaching the first major boss, Gyobu Oniwa. Gyobu is something of an anomaly in that he's a weapon-wielding enemy atop a horse, so he has the crazy movement that flailing beasts tend to have. Most of the difficulty with Gyobu stems from judging when to deflect. Since he wields a spear, there's a lot of range on his attacks, and combined with his swift movement, it can be tricky to judge when the correct time to deflect is. Just take this attack where he spins his spear in a figure of eight pattern. This can catch you off guard very easily. Otherwise, he's got a standard three-hit combo, he jumps in the air a couple times, etc, etc. All this stuff can be deflected, and recognizing that is key to defeating him. Once you wrap your head around his spear, he's actually one of the easiest encounters in the game. It still feels great to get past him, though. Upon defeating Gyobu, the game starts ramping up in intensity. From here, you can either head to the Harata Estate, if you haven't already, or continue towards Ashina Castle. Let's start with the Harata Estate. Now, when I said ramps up in intensity, what I actually meant was, this is where the game starts getting really fucking hard. The first mini-boss in the Harata Estate is the Shinobi Hunter. This guy gave me so much trouble on my very first playthrough, but as soon as you learn how to Makiri counter properly, the fight becomes a complete joke. 
It almost feels like the Shinobi Hunter's placement here is the game's way of forcing the player to learn how to deal with thrust attacks, and if that's the case, it does do its job. There's an absolute mountain of enemies to get through on the way to the main buildings, and seeing the place engulfed in flames is quite stunning imagery. After going through even more enemies, we have to take on Juzo the Drunkard. I love the fight against Juzo himself, but this encounter is a major pain in the ass. Getting past the first set of goons, killing the fodder enemies surrounding Juzo, and then taking on Juzo one-on-one, -on -one, the repetition of it all is exhausting. It's really just the fodder enemies you have to deal with first, which is the issue. Their presence drags this encounter out to nearly absurd degrees, and this is a problem people will likely run into on their first playthrough. Some early game fights drag like nothing else, almost as if you're soft-locked by the game's combat system. The inherent trial and error that comes with learning attack patterns can lead to many, many attempts at the same boss over and over again, and it is tiring. When this starts happening, progressing through the game will come down to whether the sense of accomplishment is worth it or not. For me, it is, but I imagine for others, it just won't be. But anyway, Juzo has an array of sword swings that come at you hard and fast, but in between them, he uses his body a lot, a headbutt, a palm strike, and a sumo stomp, which is probably the hardest thing to deal with. The telegraph for that attack is subtle compared to his others, and it caught me out several times, but it is deflectable, all his normal moves are, and because he is constantly on the offensive, you can achieve a tremendously satisfying flow against him. When it all comes together, it is brilliant. I love this fight, I think it's great. Immediately afterwards is Lady Butterfly, and this is another boss that gave me a hard time on my very first playthrough. In contrast to Juzo, Lady Butterfly attacks with an agile, almost elegant moveset. She is fast and fiercely aggressive, using a combination of short blades, kicks, and projectiles, interchanging between them to get right up in your face and destroy you. She also repeatedly takes to the air and attacks from above, so camera issues may be a problem here. This is the first fight where the benefits of being aggressive really become apparent. You want to deflect as much as possible, but if you suffocate her with constant pressure, you can force her into using the same moves again and again. It's the fastest way to break her posture bar by far. However, just like in Bloodborne, Committing to offense can be a significant hurdle to overcome, and even if you do so, you still need to be wary of overcommitting. You need to strike a balance with aggressiveness in this game, but if you get it right, it is super rewarding. I think Lady Butterfly is a good encounter, I just find her second phase a little disappointing. It's essentially the same as the first, but with random spirit butterflies flying after you, and illusions that must be dealt with in some form or fashion. If you have snap seeds, then you can get rid of them instantly, but it's very unlikely that you will on your first playthrough. You can avoid the illusions altogether by running around the arena until they are turned into butterflies, but all this really does is break the flow of the fight, and that's my biggest problem with her. She is a fast, aggressive enemy. You can achieve a great flow, but it's periodically interrupted, and I'm not a fan of that. She's also an example of the game deceiving the player, she only has one death blow indicator, so you'd think she only has one phase, but in reality, she has two, and this isn't the only time the game pulls this stunt. By defeating Lady Butterfly, we have conquered the Harata Estate, so back to Ashina Castle we go. Unfortunately, there exists a gatekeeper in the form of the Blazing Bull, and holy shit, this bovine bastard is one of the hardest encounters in the entire game, at least relative to its placement. It's another flailing beast enemy, and whilst its attacks can be deflected, they are difficult to read, they still damage you due to the fire, and they build up the burn status effect. On top of that, its movements are extremely erratic, leading to camera issues, it's constantly running towards you at high speed, never giving you a chance to breathe. This is a brutal encounter that drove me nigh insane on my very first playthrough. I tend to go for the run around and swing at its arse strategy, but apparently the best way to defeat it is parrying its charge and dealing damage, before retreating just to do it all again. Either way, this is my least favorite encounter in the game. There's no flow to be had against the bull, and it feels excessively punishing. With that out of the way, we can make it to Ashina Castle proper, and this is where the game opens up a bit. 
This is the central hub. From here we can reach every other location in the game, and there's nothing stopping you from going... anywhere, really. Enemies and areas are not level-gated, so you do have some freedom in this regard. We are generally guided towards the top of the castle via smoke signals. Along the way we can fight General Matsumoto, who is basically a beefed-up version of Tenzen. One could easily criticize Sekiro for how it reuses bosses and mini-bosses. Elden Ring got an awful lot of shit for recycling content, but this game seems to get a free pass in this department, despite Elden Ring being god knows how many times the size of it. I don't mind some reused mini-bosses, because I see them as the game's way of honing your skills, but I think this is valid criticism. I mean, some of them are just straight-up repeats with only the slightest of variations. Still, if a boss or mini-boss is reused, that doesn't automatically make them bad in my eyes. Is the Corrupted Monk bad just because of the true Corrupted Monk's existence or vice versa? In my opinion, no. I enjoy both fights on their own merits, where they're placed in the game and how they differ from one another, not just in a mechanical sense either. Either way, certain enemies are here specifically for practice purposes, and the next mini-boss, the Ashina Elite, is one of them. He serves as nothing more than a test of your reflexes, using the visual cue of his flashing katana to indicate when he will perform the Ashina Cross technique, forcing you to deflect with precise timing. Because of how often he performs the Ashina Cross, this is a very straightforward fight where all you need to do is time your deflections and the posture bar will take care of everything else. At the top of Ashina Castle, we have a rematch against Genichiro in one of the best fights in the game. The Ashina Elite may have been a test of your reflexes, but Genichiro is a test of everything you have learned so far, and it is ruthless. This is one of those fights where you either adhere to the game's combat philosophy, or you fail, because his moveset is specifically designed to punish those who do otherwise, while simultaneously preparing you for the rest of the adventure. Including his final phase, he has every type of perilous attack in his arsenal, effectively teaching you to recognize them and react appropriately. His comically large bow means you cannot run away without the danger of receiving damage, nor can you be careless about when to heal. He comes at you with an array of swift sword strikes, the deadliest of which being the floating passage technique, a combo of seven hits, some of which have a noticeable delay on them, once more forcing you to deflect with precise timing, rather than blocking or spamming the guard button. Genichiro is the very definition of a skill check. You can't brute force your way through him, you must play the game on its terms, and as such, it is one of the hardest encounters in all of Sekiro, particularly at this early stage. But it's also one of the most rewarding, not just to overcome, but to progress on. You can feel it when you're getting better, and it is a remarkably satisfying sensation. However, I do find his final phase a little cheeky. It's another instance of the game deceiving the player, the fight is already grueling enough as it is, but then he pulls out a third phase with new moves and extremely punishing lightning attacks. This is the first time you come up against lightning abilities, and even though the game tells you how to counter them before the fight, putting that into practice is another thing entirely, if you can even remember it in the first place. You'll likely fail the first couple times, and when you do, it is seriously deflating. I guess to counterbalance this, the final phase is a lot easier than the previous two overall, but getting lightning reversal right can be the difference. By defeating Genichiro, Wolf reunites with Kuro, who informs him that he wishes to perform the Immortal Severance Ritual, which would result in his death and ultimately prevent anyone else from fighting over his blood. To do so, we must gather certain materials, and the game is fairly explicit in what they are and where they can be found, at least for FromSoft standards anyway. First off, we must retrieve the Mortal Blade, found in the Senpu Temple, but before we get to that, I want to quickly mention the Seven Ashina Spears miniboss, another difficult encounter. This guy is deceptively fast, his spear gives him range, and he hits like an absolute truck. What makes him tricky, though, is that you have to time your Makiri counters with a bit more precision than usual. For the most part, when you see a thrust attack, you can dodge towards it and the counter will almost always land, assuming you're facing the enemy head-on, but every now and then comes an opponent where you must delay your counter ever so slightly, depending on the attack. 
That slight adjustment can be the cause of many deaths. But the true enemy here is the tight space you must fight him in. There's barely any room to work around, with a very inconveniently placed tree that's sure to get in your way, causing camera issues and other shenanigans. Not to mention the set of stairs can make positioning awkward. I mean, I think the fight itself is fine, really, but it does showcase how much difference the arena can make. The path towards the Senpu Temple is filled with monks who have abandoned their faith, seduced by a search for immortality, making them hostile. I'm not going to waste time and talk about every fodder enemy, but I do like how the game uses this opportunity to change things up a bit with monks who are primarily melee fighters. I also think it's a nice change of pace visually, with lots of growing flora and a more natural quality to the area. Soon enough we run into the armoured warrior, and honestly I don't have much to say about this fight. The way the surrounding bridge falls apart as he swings at you, and the fact that he never loses any health, makes what needs to be done pretty obvious, I feel. This is a fight with a particular gimmick, and once you figure it out, that's all there is to it. And the same applies to the main boss of this area, the folding screen monkeys. Well, sort of. These monkeys are a reference to the Three Wise Monkeys, a Japanese proverb that embody the principles of see no evil, hear no evil, and speak no evil, with the fourth monkey embodying do no evil. Apparently, including the fourth is a variation of sorts. So we need to chase down and kill all four of these monkeys. The way each one behaves is based on the principle they embody. So for example, the purple-robed monkey, see no evil, has good vision, but poor hearing. The green-robed monkey, hear no evil, has good hearing, but poor vision, and so on and so forth. This is a puzzle boss, and whilst I think the idea of it is cool, the execution seems a little questionable. My experience with the folding screen monkeys is as such. I either run around and kill them all by chance, or I kill three of the monkeys fairly quickly and then spend the next ten minutes chasing after the last one. This is a puzzle to solve, but you don't necessarily have to solve it. They've included these specific rooms to help deal with each monkey, one with a loud waterfall for the hearing monkey, and one where the lights can be extinguished for the seeing monkey, but how you're meant to drive any of the monkeys towards any particular room is a mystery to me. If it happens, great, but it certainly wasn't intentional on my behalf. Because of all this, I am completely indifferent when it comes to the folding screen monkeys. No doubt it's an interesting concept and I appreciate the change up from the usual combat, but I just don't have any strong feelings with this boss. Afterwards, we meet with the Divine Child of Rejuvenation and draw the Mortal Blade in a badass cutscene. The Mortal Blade is an Odachi, capable of slaying the Undying, or infested beings. With this in hand, we must now gather the necessary materials to reach the Divine Realm, where we will find the final component to complete the Immortal Severance Ritual. Our next destination is the Sunken Valley, which is essentially a massive canyon we must navigate with the grappling hook in search of a white lotus flower. The first mini-boss we encounter here is Snake Eyes Shirafuji, and this is another fight I remember struggling with a lot on my very first playthrough. I hear she becomes a complete joke if you use the prosthetic tool Sobimaru, but that is not something I was aware of when I played the game. This mini-boss has a tiny moveset, but her attacks are fast and devastating. It's a punishing encounter that demands consistency, because one mistake just melts your health. Behind Shirafuji is a path leading to the Gun Fort, a place teeming with enemies who possess firearms, and they are shooting at you constantly, making for an intense sequence as you traverse the broken bridge and then up into the fort itself. As we go deeper, we soon encounter the long-armed centipede giraffe. I have no idea what this thing is or how it could possibly relate to a centipede, let alone a giraffe. In fact, I think there might be a translation error here, but it's another mini-boss that serves as a test of sorts. This thing comes at you with a flurry of attacks, and the only way to deal with it is to deflect. If you keep your guard up, it'll eventually stagger you, and you will die. So the game forces you to learn how to deflect properly. 
There's a sweeping motion you must dodge, but otherwise it's two rotations of flurry attacks and that's it. Once you figure this out, the fight is very straightforward. Still, it does feel good to get down, and there's something awfully satisfying in the game's sound design. Deflecting emits a more prominent clang than blocking does, and hearing this repeatedly sounds great. It's complemented visually as well by a more distinct set of sparks. The only problem with this fight is the tiny room it's held in, which will no doubt lead to troublesome, sometimes disturbing camera issues. But at the same time, this was clearly intentional, so the player is forced to stand their ground and learn how to deflect. We make it to the Sunken Valley Passage, where there's another encounter with the Great Serpent, before we grapple our way across a wide chasm lined with gigantic body sattva statues, and once more the sense of scale is quite magnificent. At the end of the chasm we must fight the Guardian Ape in what is possibly the most infamous encounter in the game. This hulking simian epitomizes the flailing beast type enemy with erratic movement and unpredictable attack patterns. And that's where almost all the challenge lies in this fight. It's difficult to read the ape's attacks and respond appropriately as they come at you from seemingly every angle going. This thing will throw all sorts of shit at you, including actual shit. What on earth is going on here? Besides that, the ape is incredibly aggressive, and it's another case of a flailing beast enemy having attacks which are not obviously deflectable, but again, all of them are. This is a tough fight that has rightfully earned its notoriety. And when you finally defeat the thing by chopping its head off in an awesome sequence, five seconds later it picks it right back up and phase two begins. It's yet another boss where the game deceives the player with an extra phase. I mean, they even display the shinobi execution message, the cheeky bastards. Honestly, this moment is iconic. It spawned all sorts of hilarious reactions and memes across the internet when the game first released. The second phase is by no means a pushover, but it's certainly a lot easier than the first. Since the ape now wields the sword that was lodged in its head, its attacks are simpler to read and deflect. Its movements are still erratic, just not to the same degree, and there are even a couple overhead sword swings that are very generous in their telegraphs, which also stagger the ape, allowing for an easy follow-up. I do think the scream attack is a bit of a low blow on your first playthrough, though. There's no way of knowing what this will do, so when terror builds up and you instantly die, it feels a little cheap. Otherwise, I enjoy this fight, I love the transition to its second phase, and it feels like an appropriately climactic end to one of the best areas in the game. We retrieve the Lotus Flower and head back to Kuro, who tells us of our next quarry, a fragrant stone within the depths of Ashina. This has us travel to the Ashina Depths, where we must fight an alternate Snake Eyes mini-boss, before we have a rematch with the Guardian Ape. This time the ape starts off in its headless phase, and has the exact same moveset as previously, so the fight is easy. That is, until a second ape appears with the same moveset as the guardian ape's first phase, and you must deal with both of them at the same time. Now, double battles are always controversial. Some believe they are lazy, an artificial increase in difficulty, and I do understand what people mean by that. In Sekiro, it's compounded though, as combat here is not at its best when dealing with multiple enemies, let alone multiple bosses, with the camera being hit hard the most due to the aggressiveness of the apes. I think this fight is okay, but it is messy. My basic strategy here is to run around and try to isolate the two apes, which is somewhat possible if only for a limited time. I always take down the brown furred ape first, as it is much weaker than the other, and the spacious arena does help in this regard. Then it just comes down to repositioning and recognizing when to deal damage, when to back off, and so on and so forth. I've never found this encounter too troubling, but it does feel like one of the weaker fights overall. This game truly shines in one-on-one -on -one battles. Anything more than that is already at a disadvantage, and that's not even mentioning this being the same boss twice with a disrupted sense of flow. I understand why people have problems with this encounter. Past the two apes is the hidden forest. I'm not going to engage in any of the Miss Noble memes because holy shit, that horse has been beaten to death and then some, but by defeating the noble, the path to Mibu village becomes available. It's here where we must fight Orin of the Water, who appears to be an apparition of sorts. 
Orin doesn't have a big move set at all, but she makes up for that with unconventional sword swings and movement. She spins around more than a Beyblade, and it's difficult to read her attacks as a result. Still, I've found the best strategy is to let her come to you and focus on deflecting. This is where I could tell I was getting much better at the game, as it only took me two attempts to kill her. The deflection timings came naturally, and it felt great. At the end of Mibu Village is the Corrupted Monk. This fight is all about chaining deflections one after another as consistently as possible, because her posture bar recovers very quickly. This also means that dealing vitality damage whenever you can is vital, and will go a long way in defeating her. The monk wields a naginata, so she swings in long sweeping motions. As such, her attacks cover a large area, but it also means they are explicitly telegraphed. The one exception to this is her jumping attack, where she either slams the weapon down on top of you, or swings it to her left, delaying the attack ever so slightly. This is crucial to recognize, especially if you're playing the game Charmless. The monk is very aggressive, punishing those who are greedy and those who do not create enough distance when healing, but at the same time presenting many opportunities to deflect and Makiri counter. This is a great fight with a wonderful flow to it. I don't think it's quite as good as the true corrupted monk, but we'll get to that shortly. Behind the monk lies a cave where we find what we are looking for, the Shelter Stone. When we get back to Ashina Castle, we encounter our father, the Great Shinobi Owl. Turns out he too is itching for Kuro's blood, and orders Wolf to renounce his loyalty to the boy. This is where you're presented with a choice, to either obey the Iron Code and forsake Kuro, or break the Iron Code and stay loyal to him. So this game has four different endings, Shura, Immortal Severance, Purification, and Dragon's Return. Shura and Immortal Severance are the most likely outcomes as they occur naturally depending on which option you choose right here. These are both considered bad endings in comparison to the other two, especially the Shura ending which, if selected, shortens the game by completely locking the player out of the Fountainhead Palace, which to me is just sacrilege, but the reason they're considered bad is because of the outcomes themselves. To get the Purification and Dragon's Return endings, you need to stay loyal to Kuro, and then complete a set of extremely obscure prerequisites that I cannot imagine anyone would possibly fulfill without some sort of guide. Seriously, I would never have figured this stuff out on my own, but that's a conversation for a different time. Choosing to forsake the Iron Code will result in a battle against the Great Shinobi Owl. This is an amazing fight, two shinobi going head to head, swords clashing in an encounter between father and son, it's quite the spectacle. Owl isn't as big a skill check as Genichiro, but he still provides significant challenge. And just like Genichiro, you need to adhere to the game's combat philosophy to defeat him. Something of note is the sheer size of his katana. It's huge, covering a wide area in front of him, so dodging and sprinting away is made very dangerous. Owl will deflect your attacks, and you need to do the same to him, while seizing every opportunity to get some damage in. Due to the simplicity and singular nature of his moveset, I found it extra important to recognize certain tells. For example, if he swings twice and then turns his back to swing again, it's always a double swing on the follow-up. If he throws his shurikens twice, he will always jump in the air and perform an overhead slash. If he throws just one shuriken, he will always attack with a massive sweeping motion next. Understanding these types of patterns can make all the difference, as it allows you to respond appropriately. The one thing that caught me out the most were his firecrackers. It's a devastating attack, but it follows a similar pattern to the ones I just mentioned. It's always preceded by a shoulder bash first, and learning that was crucial to avoiding it. These are the kind of things you must internalize in this game, and whilst the same applies to every boss to an extent, this is one of a few encounters where it is particularly prominent. His second phase is the same as the first, except now he'll throw down poison, as well as a charm of some sort which disables healing items. When he throws this charm, it's possible to get in a couple easy hits, and that seems a bit off to me. He also creates a puff of smoke which can either be very annoying or completely pointless, as he doesn't always follow up on it. In the latter's case, all this serves to do is arbitrarily disrupt the fight, and I don't like it. That's the only real criticism I have with this encounter. 
Now we've defeated Owl, we can finally make it to the Fountainhead Palace. We do this by heading back to the cave where we found the Shelter Stone and praying in the Palanquin. This is where an enormous rope, which is apparently referred to as a Shiminawa in Japan, picks us up and transports us there. Before we can enter the place proper, we must face the true corrupted monk, and this is one of my favorite fights in the game. First off, the setting is stunning. The vermilion bridge, the trees overhead, the falling leaves, and the way they move with each of the monk's attacks. It is majestic. I even noticed one of my sword swings cut off a branch here. I've never seen that before. For the actual fight itself, the first two phases are almost exactly the same as the Corrupted Monk from Mibu Village, the only difference being she takes more posture damage and her posture doesn't recover as rapidly. So this means focusing on deflections and nothing else is a viable strategy, and once again there's a wonderful flow to be achieved here. Then, in the third phase, the centipede erupts from her body and she becomes extremely aggressive, so dodging plays a bigger role. She's also rocking new attacks, some brand new and others missing from the fight in Mibu Village, and there's something awfully feral about the way she handles herself in this phase. I absolutely adore this encounter. I feel it encompasses everything great about this game's combat system. Past the bridge lies the Fountainhead Palace. Visually, it is gorgeous, the prettiest area in the game. The giant cherry blossom tree overlooking the Great Lake with Mibu Manor situated atop a waterfall is equal parts romantic and mysterious. There's a distinct aura about the place that is unlike any other, and I particularly enjoy the way cherry blossoms are constantly falling around you. To me, it adds a sense of sophistication and majesty to the place. But despite the way it looks, the Fountainhead Palace is fraught with danger. Attempting to swim in the Great Lake will result in death, as there's a feller on the other side who pelts you with lightning, so we must go through Mibu Manor. Without Kuro's charm, this is probably the hardest area in the game, because the palace nobles here use an ability which results in enfeeblement, rendering you completely helpless for around 30 seconds. Once we get to the other side, we can take down the Okami leader Shizu, allowing us to freely explore the Great Lake. There's a humongous carp fish here, which must be avoided as we swim through a tunnel and towards the sanctuary. At the top of the hill lies a maiden sleeping peacefully, and praying here teleports us to the Divine Realm. This is where we must face the Divine Dragon, for we need the dragon's tears to reify the Immortal Severance ritual. The Divine Dragon is one of the easiest fights in the game, but in terms of sheer spectacle, it blows every other encounter out of the water. The visuals are amazing, the soundtrack is magnificent, and the scale is phenomenal. This fight is all about grappling to these trees and using lightning reversal to deal damage. There are some attacks to avoid, but otherwise that's all you need to do. This is not a hard fight at all, but it is fun, and honestly, I find it beautiful. Some people may dislike it for its lack of challenge, I am not one of them. Upon receiving the gracious gift of tears, we are teleported back to Ashina Castle, where the sun has fully set and it is now nighttime. From here we can do quite a few things, one of which being taking on the Lone Shadow Masanaga. I'm not going to go into this fight in detail, but something I will say is that I made the mistake of running away too much. You don't have a lot of room to breathe here, and I found myself suffocated by his constant attacks in such a tight space. But running away was not the right move. As soon as I stood my ground and started trading blows with him, the fight became a lot easier. It was just a reminder of how the game wants you to operate no matter who the opponent is. And yes, that also applies to the Demon of Hatred, although I would not blame anyone for thinking otherwise. Now for me, this has always been the hardest boss. It's certainly what I struggled with the most on this playthrough, and its mere inclusion in this game is a point of contention for some. The most common criticism of the Demon of Hatred is that he is a Bloodborne boss in Sekiro and it doesn't work. I think that's an easy conclusion to reach, but after facing this boss repeatedly, I disagree with it. The Demon of Hatred is a flailing beast. He has all the characteristics you'd expect from one, erratic movements, attacks that are difficult to read and so on, but once again you can deflect all of his attacks, except for those that come from his flame arm, which will require you to either dodge or jump with timing in mind, which doesn't seem all that different to the way perilous attacks are handled. 
The one exception to this is the amount of sprinting this fight requires, which is far more than any other. The thing about the Demon of Hatred, he has a moveset, and defeating him comes down to responding to that moveset, just like any other boss. Once you understand it, the fight becomes surprisingly easy, again, just like any other boss. But the process of learning how to respond is exceptionally tedious. This thing has a huge number of attacks, each phase introduces new ones that are extremely punishing and destroy you in just one or two hits. Combine this with its massive health pool, and learning the fight becomes a complete slog. This fight drags more than any other in the game, and it's easily its weakest aspect. This is an encounter I always used to hate, but I forced myself to learn it properly for the sake of completing the Shura Gauntlet, and I've actually grown to appreciate it in recent times. Not to mention the musical piece is enjoyable, and the spectacle is great as well. I still think it is too long, too punishing, and learning it is a tedious slog, but I like its inclusion here. It only took five years to reach this point, but reach it, I have. And so now we can finally end the game. We head back to the Ashina Reservoir and find Kuro under attack by Genichiro, who somehow managed to get his hands on a second mortal blade, one which is black and is said to hold the power to open a gate to the underworld. The final encounter begins with a single phase fight against Genichiro, Way of Tomoe. It's the exact same fight as before, except now instead of lightning attacks, he uses an empowered mortal draw. This is very much the warm-up, for once he is defeated, he uses the Black Blade to sacrifice himself and revive Ishin Ashina in his prime, so that the clan might be restored. For all his flaws and delusions, you cannot deny that Genichiro possessed conviction. Ishin the Sword Saint is, in my opinion, tied for the best fight in the game, but he is surely one of the very best final bosses in all of gaming. This encounter is the culmination of everything you have learned throughout your playthrough, and serves as the ultimate test. By utilizing a sword in his first phase, and then a spear and a firearm in his second and third, this guy has the most varied moveset in all of Sekiro. A grand mix of thrust attacks, sweeps, lightning attacks, multi-hit combos, Ashina Cross, Ichimonji, Floating Passage, and a bunch more crazy abilities. This is easily amongst the most difficult encounters in the game, and most of that difficulty lies in how flexible and interchangeable his moves are. Conquering his sword phase is one thing, but when he pulls out his spear his attacks become much more diversified. It is a massive difficulty spike, as there is effectively an entire new moveset to learn, with attacks that combine with those used in his previous phase. Sword and Spear enemies on their own already demand alternate approaches from the player, due to the differences in size, range, damage output, the windows between attacks, and so on and so forth, but Ishin blends these things together to form a brutally challenging opponent. But the beauty of the Sword Saint is if you have made it this far, you have the skill required to defeat him. It just comes down to putting everything you have learnt into practice, and goodness me, it is glorious. Once again, being aggressive is hugely beneficial, especially as you enter his final phase, where the lightning reversal technique provides so much value. As such, the flow you can achieve in this fight is amazing. There is something special about the Sword Saint. It's an encounter that exemplifies everything great about Sekiro's combat system, because his moveset encompasses all its best features. It is a spectacular boss fight, and again, one of the very best final bosses you are ever likely to find. I'd love to sit here and tell you I was stuck on this guy for hours and hours, and I was on my very first playthrough, but by the time I reached him on this one, I had fully adjusted to the Demon Bell, the lack of Kuro's charm, and the controller. It only took me two attempts, and it was incredible. There's still a few more fights to cover, so let's go over them. By completing a bunch of vague activities for the purification ending, we can visit an alternate version of Hirata Estate. There's a couple repeat mini-bosses here, but the main attraction is an encounter against Owl Father. This is basically a faster, more aggressive version of the Great Shinobi Owl, with many of the same attacks, but some extras thrown in there as well. In fact, his first phase is almost one for one identical to the previous fight, and it's only in the second phase where things change up a bit. 
This comes in the form of an ethereal owl, which he will use to either teleport to a location or launch as a fiery projectile, both of which are very simple to avoid. Honestly, I have always been indifferent towards this fight because I already spent so long dying to the great shinobi owl that by the time I reach Owl Father, I know his moveset inside out. Remember how I talked about recognizing tells from that fight? Well, nearly all of them are present here. Fundamentally, it is the same with some added flair, but that flair does bring a couple issues. The teleporting owl mechanic is a bit of a joke and disrupts the fight, the pillars in the arena can get in your way, and the flying owl blocks your view on occasion. Still, there are ways Owl Father improves upon its counterpart. I enjoy how he can cancel his use of Ichimonji and convert it into a sweep, forcing you to face him head on and focus on deflecting. His moveset is faster paced and more varied, making him unpredictable, and he doesn't leave himself open to easy hits like the great shinobi does. To me, this fight is good. I wouldn't rate it above the true monk and definitely not above the sword saint, but it is fun. Choosing to obey the Iron Code will lead to the Shura ending, where you must fight Emma and Old Man Ishin. Emma is a simple encounter. Her fighting style is reminiscent of Orin's in that she doesn't have the largest moveset and attacks you swiftly with multi-hit combos, usually incorporating a delay between them. There is something graceful about the way she moves, but she's still dangerous with a very large range on her grab and ash and a cross attack. This is another fight where you can completely suffocate the boss by being aggressive, cancelling some of her attacks and forcing her into repeating the same moves. Even without that though, by this point of the game, this fight should only take a few attempts at most. Ishin's first phase is very similar to the Sword Saint's first phase, and if you have any experience with the latter, then nothing in the former will come as a surprise. Standard attacks, all clearly telegraphed, stuff you have seen before, etc, etc. There is one exception though. Occasionally Ishin will dodge your attack with a sidestep and respond with a quick counterattack or a grab. I can't think of any other instance where a boss does something like this, besides Al Father, so it caught me out repeatedly, and I like that. It's something different, although the counterattack is more effective than the grab, without a doubt. His second phase is far more dangerous and contains original attacks not seen anywhere else in the game, including One Mind, an insane ability that is reminiscent of Virgil from Devil May Cry. It feels great to deflect this technique, although one of the slashes always seems to slip through. I thought I was doing something wrong, but it happens every single time, so I'm going to blame the game. But the deadliest thing in this phase is fire. Suddenly, Ishin's attacks are imbued with fire, so Ichimonji comes with a fan of flames on the follow-up, he creates a torrent of flames that travels across the floor, and a couple more fire-related abilities. Personally, I find this a little underwhelming, because the flame attacks are overly telegraphed, I feel, giving you plenty of time to dodge out the way, and it kind of undermines the fight. I'm not saying it's easy, but I certainly think it's less challenging than the Sword Saint, and in terms of sheer quality, it doesn't even come close, especially since this is the final boss of the Shura ending. Fire may be a neat party trick, but this fight just isn't as riveting as the Sword Saint. Although, I suppose that's to be expected, as Ishin is no longer in his prime. Anyway, this ending will have Wolf slaughter Emma, Ishin, and eventually Owl, as he turns into Shura, a metaphorical demon of sorts that engulfs the Ashina province in flame and bloodshed. The Immortal Severance ending has Wolf help Kuro carry out the ritual, killing the boy in the process. Wolf then takes the sculptor's place at the dilapidated temple and passes time carving Buddha statues, just like his predecessor. The purification ending has Wolf sacrifice himself to purify Kuro of his blood in a bittersweet but lovely conclusion, whilst the Dragon's Return ending sees the Divine Child of Rejuvenation sort of absorb Kuro into herself. She and Wolf then set out to travel west, to return the Divine Dragon from whence it came, and end the Dragon's heritage from returning to Japan. I would describe the story of Sekiro as simple but engaging. Some of it is legitimately fascinating and deserves a hell of a lot more attention than I have given in this video, but not so much the narrative itself, but rather the concepts surrounding the narrative. The Undying, the Mortal Blades, the Divine Realm, and the link between those who possess the Dragon's Heritage, to name just a few. 
I don't think this game's lore has the same spellbinding quality that Bloodborne's lore has, but that may just be because I am not as knowledgeable of it compared to that game. Either way, the story does its job of giving purpose to your actions. There's a lot of stuff I have omitted, but the game is positively bursting with secrets and hidden details that go a long way in giving this world its own identity. The steps you need to take to achieve the Purification and Dragon's Return endings always make me laugh at how ridiculously obscure they are, but they do lead to some of the most memorable sequences in the whole game. The absolute highlight for me is slaying the Great Serpent in the Sunken Valley, plunging into the beast's head and then ripping it open as blood rains down from the sky. Holy shit, this is metal. There's also a few side quests to complete, and I want to highlight two of them. There's this fella in the dilapidated temple named Hanbei the Undying, who serves as a training partner of sorts, a means of practicing your combat skills. As his name suggests, he is immortal, and craves a way to end his curse. Well, once you get the Mortal Blade, you can do just that, and he expresses a deep gratitude for it. Upon killing him, he leaves behind a hidden tooth, which is an unlimited use version of Bite Down, an item that kills you. I read a comment somewhere that the hidden tooth resembles a molar stuffed with Bite Down, and seems to be the result of Hanbei trying to kill himself countless times just to end his misery. This is an interesting interaction all round, but the game makes no effort whatsoever to guide you here, in classic FromSoft fashion. The second quest involves the Great Carp Attendant and his daughters. When you reach Mibu Manor, there's a lady here who warns you about the palace nobles and the dangers they pose. If you follow up the conversation, she tells you about her father, who, after becoming a noble, has found himself entranced by the Great Carp. The lady then asks you to free her father from the carp's bewitching powers. Past Mibu Manor, you can find the second daughter, standing atop the roof of a half-submerged building. She explains that she is looking for her father, and reveals the underwater passage into the palace, whilst also requesting that we open the palace doors for her. If you do this and return to the place later on, you can find the second daughter kneeling over the corpses of palace nobles, and violently stabbing them repeatedly. In her rage, she screams about how the nobles lied to her father and tricked him into doing the Great Carp's bidding for all eternity, before she collapses dead on the floor. When you speak to the Great Carp attendant, he makes no mention of his daughters and seems entirely focused on the will of the Great Carp. If you feed the Great Carp the truly precious bait, it will die, and its corpse can be found in the Sunken Valley. Which makes sense, as the Sunken Valley is the area where the waters of the Fountainhead Palace flow to. Looting the carp will give you the Great White Whisker, and if you present this to the attendant, he is grateful that his duties have finally come to an end. You can then return to him one last time to find his remaining daughter kneeling by his corpse. The lady says some final parting words before she too passes away. I've always had the achievement for killing the Great Carp, but I had no idea there was a questline involving the attendant's daughters linked to it. A dynamic world is nothing surprising when it comes to From Software, but it's always exciting when you discover something new. I'm sure there are other questlines like this, but these two have a particular sadness about them, and I think they stand out because of that. To end this video, we shall discuss the Gauntlets of Strength. These are a series of consecutive battles against previously defeated bosses. There are three in total, and each one ends against an enhanced version of a major boss. Those are Inner Genichiro, Inner Father, and Inner Ishin, the Sword Saint version. During the Gauntlet, Wolf's attack power is strictly defined and any items used are reset at the end. After every boss is defeated, except for the Inner variants, a Sculptor's Idol will appear allowing you to rest in between fights. So it's essentially a boss rush mode with rests. These fights are completely unchanged from the main game, so we don't have to waste time discussing them, but because Wolf's attack power is strictly defined, they are automatically made more difficult. It's highly likely that you will have more attack power on your actual playthrough, at least I certainly did. The inner variants, however, are much more challenging alternate versions of their original iterations with brand new attacks and abilities. Because of this, they are considered separate encounters entirely, and are the biggest draws of the gauntlets. If you manage to reach one of the inner variants, you can fight them again in a standalone reflection, meaning you do not have to beat them to get some practice in, 
which is good, because otherwise this would be a nigh impossible task. Overcoming these gauntlets basically requires mastery of every encounter, and completing them was one of the most exhausting things I have done in a video game in a very long time. There is nothing more frustrating than going all the way through a gauntlet just to die at the very end. I mean, look how close I was here. This is just sad. I knew I could make my life easier by releasing the effects of the Demon Bell and Kuro's Charm, but I just thought, what's the point of that? I've made it this far, may as well take it all the way. But enough dilly-dallying, let's talk about these inner fights. Now, if I had to rank each one from worst to best, I would do so as such. Inner Ishin, Inner Genichiro, and finally Inner Father takes the top spot. Inner Ishin is a good encounter on its own merits, I just think when compared to the other inner fights, it's missing something. Inner Genichiro and Inner Father offer significantly different experiences from their originals, but Inner Ishin doesn't quite do this to the same degree. He's rocking some new moves, but fundamentally the fight plays out at an almost identical rhythm to the Sword Saint, so these new moves feel like they've just been included to catch the player out. I enjoy a couple of the new combo strings, but the dynamic of the fight is largely unchanged, and that's why I think it falls flat. Inner Genichiro stands well above any other iteration of him because he is far more aggressive. He doesn't bring many new attacks to the table, I think it's something like three or four in total, but he regularly mixes up his combos with quite a lot of variation, including reversing your lightning reversal, so you must reverse it right back. Inner Genichiro keeps up the pressure constantly, whilst greatly punishing passivity. I found the best tactic is to match his aggression, and when you combine this with his mix-ups, you have the makings of a wonderfully dynamic encounter. This is a great fight, but I must say he does suffer from the same issue as several other bosses, in that his attacks can often be interrupted. But the creme de la creme of the inner variance is without a doubt, Inner Father. Earlier I stated that the Sword Saint was tied for the best fight in the game, well this is the encounter it is tied with. Inner Father doesn't have that all-encompassing moveset like the Sword Saint has, nor does it serve as the epic final battle that puts everything you have learned to the test like the Sword Saint either, but it makes up for all of that with sheer speed. This is a blisteringly fast encounter, even more so if you play aggressively. I love the integration of the Mist Raven in his moveset, it makes for incredibly fun deflection opportunities and keeps up the pace. Not to mention he has two different types of triple combo strings with the Mist Raven, in addition to his normal double slices. Like Genichiro, Inner Father is constantly mixing up his combos, leading to a lot of variation. He even combines combos to form new attack chains. This fight is absolutely thrilling. I mean, the speed of the encounter alone makes it stand out, but all these factors come together and elevate it to something truly special. It does suffer from a couple of the same issues as Al Father, though. Sometimes the pillars get in the way, the Owl can block your vision, and I certainly think he is too easily interrupted by your attacks, even more so than Genichiro. The amount of times you can just stop him in his tracks seems a bit silly, but those are the only criticisms I have to an otherwise brilliant boss fight. The reward for completing a gauntlet is a different form for Wolf. The Tengu and Shura outfits are my favourites. They look great. It's just a shame they were the very last things I unlocked. I can't imagine I'll play the game again for some time, so I won't be getting much use out of them. If you complete all three gauntlets, you unlock the Mortal Journey, a mega gauntlet that pits you against every single boss in a row, including the three inner variants. And your reward for completing this gauntlet is jack shit. Seriously, you get nothing for doing this, and the game straight up tells you as much, which I think was a smart move. Even after five years, Sekiro's combat is just as brutal, intimate, and satisfying as I remember. What truly makes it shine, though, is how posture is implemented. When attacking and deflecting both lead towards the same goal, offense and defense are blended together seamlessly, so much so that the line between them no longer exists. Nearly all other facets of combat feed into this, and it recontextualizes engagements. It is incredibly potent and easily the game's strongest aspect. This concept is then streamlined into the mechanics in a way that puts everything directly onto the player's ability. Because of this, it asks an awful lot, 
but gives so much back in return, and it remains my all-time favourite FromSoft title. Sekiro Shadows Die Twice is the great outlier, and I hope it's not the last. Elden Ring may have taken the world by storm, but there are still countless opportunities for more tightly focused adventures. I've always vibed more with the likes of Bloodborne and Sekiro than the Souls series, personally, and as much as I love Elden Ring, I find it easier to go back to those two titles than that one. Yeah, that's just me, but a market for these types of games still exists, without a doubt, and even the most stalwart of Elden Ring fans would welcome them, I feel. People have faith in From Software for good reason. Bloodborne and Sekiro are great examples of what happens when the development team branch out a bit, and the result is two very special titles. I hope to see more of that in the future. Thank you for watching, please let me know what you think. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more content that goes into detail on games, then you should hit the subscribe button. Thanks again.